testing live now. So I would like to ask all people so who are registered um, to hold on for um, VAP, Diagnosis and Treatment in the ICU. Um, I'm very happy to have Jean Chastre here with uh, us today. We'll be uh, presenting on the um, management of uh, pneumonia uh, in the next uh, 40 to 45 minutes. We will have some questions and um, answers after that. Um, if you have a question, I would like you to, uh, to use the question tab on the webinar control panel. You will see that there is the possibility there to ask questions uh, and uh, we will make a selection. The um, webinar is a general overview of the problem of the AP and uh, HAP in the uh, ICU. Um, and it's actually part of an educational track that the SICM is introducing. If you want to learn more about uh, pneumonia in the ICU, I would recommend you to uh, register for the uh, course we will be uh, hosting in November, the end of November, November 21st and 22nd. You will all find all information on the ESICM uh, website. Registration uh, is open, so go to the website, have a look. It's a one and a half day uh, course, and of course, we look forward to seeing you there. So this is uh, just a short introduction. Jean Chastre from Paris, uh, France, will um, give this uh, overview, and I'm more than happy to uh, give the floor to you, uh, Jean. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Jan. So my pleasure to participate to this webinar. So this is the first uh, uh, slide. I put my disclosure uh, on it. So the next one is the outline. We will go uh, through the diagnosis, initial selection of antimicrobial therapy, optimizing PKPD parameters. As you know, this is also a very important issue. De-escalation, and how is it possible to shorten a little bit the duration of treatment, at least in many cases. So as you know, there are a lot of controversies and debate regarding the optimal clinical approach uh, to the diagnosis of, of, of pneumonia in the ICU, particularly uh, regarding hospital-acquired pneumonia and or ventilator-associated pneumonia. As you know, uh, uh, most of the time we are using very simple criteria. First, clinical observation, suggesting infection, new onset of fever, purulent sputum, leukocytosis, increased minute ventilation, arterial deoxygenation, or the need for increasing the vasopressor infusion. Secondly, of course, to confirm the diagnosis, we need a positive microbiological culture for pathogens from the respiratory secretion, of course. And also, very importantly, because as you know, this is a major criterion for making the diagnosis of pneumonia, we need to confirm the involvement of the deep compartment of the lung, and therefore we need to demonstrate, to document a new or a progressive persistent radiographic infiltrate. And this is, of course, a major criterion, but very difficult to obtain in the ICU because most of the time it, it, it's really impossible to demonstrate a new or a progressive persistent radiographic infiltrate. We have a lot of data, in fact, showing that the accuracy of those clinical signs of VAP are not so good. This is uh, one slide showing the results of all autopsy uh, studies having assessed the potential efficacy of those the, the, the signs and symptoms. And as you can see on the slide, for fever, abnormal white blood cell counts, purient sputum, and so on, the negative likelihood ratio and also the positive likelihood ratio compared to the gold standard, which is the results of autopsy. As you can see, for all those signs, including 
documentation of a new infiltrate. Those signs are a very poor negative likelihood ratio and also very poor positive likelihood ratio. And therefore, we need, in clinical practice, we need some major improvement in, in, in the tools we are using. Because, of course, using only those very simple criteria, in many cases, it will be extremely difficult to confirm or to exclude the invasion of the lung parenchyma by a bacterial pathogen, which is to say, to distinguish between a patient with a true pneumonia and a patient merely colonized or with only some form of trachobronchitis. I will come back to this issue in, in, in a moment. As you know, of course, the first step of any diagnostic strategy for making the diagnosis of lung infection in the ICU on a patient under mechanical ventilation is to uh, uh, be sure that the clinical features suggesting infection are present. And this is not so easy, in fact. And many times at the bedside, there is no consensus at all between all the ICU doctors. For some doc doctors, it will be clear cut that we need to uh, pull the trigger and engage uh, a diagnostic strategy. But in many other ICU doctors, they will maybe consider that the signs and symptoms present at that time are not sufficient to, to push the target. Anyway, and this is a major take home message, if you decide to go forward, because for you the clinical features suggesting infection are uh, really present, in that case, you need to get a sampling, a, a specimen from the distal airways. And you need to do that before the introduction of new antibiotics. This is really a key issue. As you know, as shown on the next slide, if you are getting the pulmonary secretions after the introduction of new antibiotics, it will be too late. Never do that. This is really a major take-home message. You need to be able, in the ICU, to get some pulmonary secretion specimens before the introduction of new antibiotics. It makes a lot of sense, of course, because if you are getting the pulmonary secretions after the introduction of new antibiotics, even a few doses of antibiotics will decrease the bacterial burden present in the lower ways. And therefore, in that case, it will not be possible anymore to distinguish between a true pneumonia and some efficacy of the new antibiotics and the absence of a true pneumonia before getting the new pulmonary secretion. So be very careful. Always get the specimens you need before the introduction of new antibiotics. Of course, probably the optimal strategy would be to be able to get a very good distal specimen using bronchoscopy with bronchoalveolar lavage. Using this tool, it's possible to get a very reliable specimen from the deep compartment of the lung and to examine uh, the alveolar compartment. As shown on the slide, using bronchoalveolar lavage, it's possible to get the secretions, the distal secretions, at the level of the deep compartment of the lung. You will get the cells and the fluids lining the alveoli. And therefore, 
using macroscopic examination of this specimen, it's possible to document the two major criteria for making the diagnosis of pneumonia. First, you will get the neutrophilic involvement of the deep compartment, as you can see on the slide. All the alveolar macrophages have disappeared, and there are now a lot of neutrophils. And as you can see, using this technique, this is a, 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 a gram stand, you will be able to document the presence of a microorganism, the pathogens directly responsible for the pneumonia. And therefore, it's possible to design a very simple diagnostic strategy guided by bronchoalveolar lavage results, as shown on the slide. As you can see, based on the direct specimen examination, and you will get that result less than one hour after the fiber optic bronchoscopy, if there are some microorganisms present, you will first document the reality of lung infection, and also you will be able immediately to go back to your patient and to prescribe new antibiotics using the examination results and your local epidemiology for selecting the initial antimicrobial therapy. However, if there are no microorganisms at all visible on the gram staining, in that case, it's possible probably to postpone a little bit the initiation of new antibiotics. In that case, you will look at the presence or absence of signs of severe sepsis. Of course, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, in that case, <coughs> you need to start immediately new antibiotics using the uh, uh, recommendation available in, in the guidelines. But if, once again, the patient does not present any microorganisms, and if there are no signs at all of severe sepsis, in that case, it's possible to postpone antibiotics to observe and look for another infection, an extra pulmonary infection, for, for example. And this is very important because doing that, it's more easy, it's easier to document the presence of another extra pulmonary infection that could be the cause for the new onset of fever, for example. On day two or three, you will get the results of the semi-quantitative or quantitative cultures of the BL fluid, and based on that, it will be possible to modify or to adjust your antimicrobial agents. And we have a lot of data in human beings, but also in animal models showing the accuracy of such a diagnostic tool. This is a very old study done by Professor Johansson in the US in 1988. As you can see, in that animal model using pig baboons, it was possible, of course, to compare the bacterial burden present at the level of the lung on the left, the results obtained by the protected specimen brush, by bronchoalveolar lavage, by uh, aspiration of the lung using a needle or using uh, endotracheal aspirate cultures. As you can see, compared to the lung, using the bronchoalveolar lavage, you will get 20 of the 27 microorganisms present at the level of the lung. And you will miss only three uh, 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 bacteria pre present 
uh, in, in, in the lung. Using tracheal aspirate, of course, you will get also most of the microorganisms present at the level of the lung, but you will also, and this is a major drawback of this technique, you will also get 14 microorganisms present in the endotracheal uh, aspirate culture results and not present into the lung. There are several randomized controlled trials having assessed potential utility of such uh, a strategy for guiding the antibiotic exposure in patients suspected of ventilator-associated pneumonia in the ICU. This is one of the studies we did a couple of years ago, more than 17 years ago now, showing that using this decision tree, it was possible to decrease the antibiotic exposure as measured by the number of antibiotic free days, whatever the type of antimicrobial agents used by the doctors at the bedside. Of course, nothing is perfect. And as you know, there are some potential drawbacks of all the fiber optic bronchoscopic techniques for the diagnosis of ventilator-associated pneumonia. There are some false negative cultural results, which is really uh, 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 very worrisome, of course. The results are not always completely reproducible. As I said before, anyway, the respiratory specimens should be obtained before starting or modifying the antibiotic therapy. Some early forms of infection could be missed, and you need maybe some specialized laboratory and clinical skills. But in fact, this strategy is really available in many ICUs because it's very easy to do a fiber optic bronchoscopy in a patient receiving mechanical ventilation, and also the techniques used by the lab are not so complicated. This is exactly the same technique that the techniques that are used, for example, for uh, urine uh, cultures. So nothing very complicated. Of course, there are other possibilities for making the diagnosis. For example, you could, if it's not possible for you to have access to a fiber optic bronchoscopy, it's possible to use a blind technique using a protected catheter, the combicat technique. I've shown a slide. Using this technique, it's very easy to get specimen from the distal airways, wedging the combicat catheter through the endotracheal prosthesis to get a specimen from the deep compartment of the lung. But of course, this is a blinded technique, and therefore, you could, using this technique, miss the true infected area into the lung. So be careful. Using this technique, you need uh, uh, to interpret very carefully the results before to be sure that it's possible to exclude the diagnosis of pneumonia. It's also possible to use the results of quantitative cultures of the endotracheal aspirate. As you know, in a patient receiving mechanical ventilation, it's very easy to get those proximal airway secretions, very easy to, to do, and doing semi-quantitative or quantitative cultures, it will be able to have a good reflection of the bacterial burden present into the deep compartment, as shown on the slide. But, as I said before, using this technique, you will get the microorganisms lining the deep compartment involved in the pneumonia, but also a lot of microorganisms present only at the level of the proximal airways. And therefore, using this technique, 
you will be okay, but probably sometimes you will overtreat your patient. But this is acceptable, really. There are other strategies that could be used to increase uh, uh, our possibilities for diagnosis pneumonia in the ICU. First of all, sometimes the suspicion of pneumonia is not so important. Only a little bit of a new fever, some maybe some purulence uh, uh, of the sputum, of the endotracheal uh, se se secretion, but the patient is very stable. No modification of the ventilator setting, no decline in uh, the oxygenation. So, one strategy in that case would be to use a very short duration of antibiotics for covering uh, the possibility of a true pneumonia, but de-escalating very rapidly after one or three days of antibiotics only. So this is quite similar to a preemptive strategy. This is a very recent paper from Michael Klumpas, published in Clinical Infection Disease, showing that using such very short duration of treatment in that type of patient, remember, patient suspected of developing a pneumonia, but with very minimal a sign or symptoms of infection and very stable, very stable, no decline in oxygenation, no decline in the hemodynamic status. As you know, we are now in the possibility of using uh, uh, some sophisticated microbiological approach. And this is not really Star Trek, but a little bit. Using these new molecular approaches, it's possible to gain a lot of time regarding the pathogen identification and the determination of the susceptibility pattern. So therefore, using these new tools, it's possible to uh, uh, modify very early in the course of the disease the antibiotics selected for the initial treatment and therefore to adjust the uh, therapy in order to better cover uh, 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 the microorganisms responsible for, for infection. And for example, it's now possible in many hospitals to use the Malditoff techniques, as you may know. This is a matrix, cystoid laser desorption ionization, time of flight, and using this technique, it's possible to get the identification of the pathogen very early after, let me say, roughly a little bit less than one day after having collected the initial specimen, and also sometimes very early in the course of the disease to have some data regarding the efficacy of uh, uh, the antibiotic, because using these techniques, it's possible using the molecular technology to get to, to know whether or not the bug is resistant. As I said before, a lot of controversies still uh, uh, regarding the diagnosis of ventilator-associated pneumonia. And as you may know, there is a new concept, which is ventilator-associated trachoma bronchitis, which could be the way to go for improving the therapy of patients receiving mechanical ventilation in the ICU. The definition of ventilator-associated trachoma bronchitis is really a key issue. You need to use a very strict microbiological criteria for defining this disease, ventilator-associated tracheal bronchitis. Because otherwise, you will consider 
that every patient under mechanical ventilation in your own ICU is suffering that disease, ventilator-associated trichrombronchitis. So at least two of the following criteria, body temperature more than 38.5 degrees Celsius, some leukocytosis, and some modification of the endotracheal aspirate. So exactly the same criteria that the criteria we are using for making the diagnosis of ventilator-associated pneumonia. The only difference is that for making the diagnosis of trichobronchitis, we need, you need no, no radiographic evidence at all of pneumonia, which is no new, no progressive persistent radiographic infiltrate. Okay, as I said before, this is very difficult in, in the ICU because most mechanically ventilated patients have some kind of pulmonary abnormalities on just chest X-ray. You need also to use a very strict microbiological criterion, at least 10 to the fifth CFU per ml for the results of the quantitative endotracheal aspirate cultures, or if you are using bronchoalveolar lavage for making this diagnosis, you need to use exactly the same cutoff as the cutoff we are using for defining ventilator-associated pneumonia. So remember, very strict criteria. The only difference between the two diseases is that in patients with trichobronchitis, there are no radiographic modifications. Once again, this is very difficult to differentiate VAT versus VAT. And therefore, of course, if you are using those criteria, you will get a, a, a picture very similar uh, to the picture of ventilator-associated pneumonia. This is a very important study done by Ignacio Martin Loeches, published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine two years ago. As you can see on the slide, comparing patients with VAT, patients with VAP, ventilator-associated pneumonia, and a control group of patients with no, no uh, uh, infection, no lower respiratory tract infection. So duration of mechanical ventilation in patients with VAT was very similar to the duration of mechanical ventilation in patients with VAT. The only difference between the, the two groups was the mortality, in fact. In patients with VAP, the mortality was a little bit higher. Remember, this is okay to use the concept of ventilator-associated tracheal bronchitis in the ICU. This is okay, but only, only if you are using the very strict definition we reviewed together a minute ago. Otherwise, you will use a lot of systemic antibiotics in patients with only proximal airways colonization. And this is really potentially concerning. You will facilitate colonization and super infection with multi-drug resistant microorganisms. So be very cautious. This is really a slippery slope. And this is, in fact, the recommendation made by uh, our colleagues from the U.S. in the recently published IDSA-ATS guidelines, as you can see on the slide, in patients with VAT, ventilator-associated trichobronchitis, we suggest not providing antibiotic therapy. Weak recommendation, low quality evidence. And in fact, of course, if you are using the new definition of trichobronchitis, using a very high cutoff regarding the results of ETI and BL cultures, in that case, of course, probably, you need to start immediately new antibiotics. 
the selection of initial antimicrobial therapy. In fact, this is not so easy, and probably we make a lot of mistakes initially. Why? But of course, be because the bugs responsible for the new infection in the ICU are most of the time very resistant to uh, the antibiotics, and therefore it's not so easy to select the optimal therapy uh, uh, at the beginning, of course. This is the bugs essentially responsible for that type of infection. This is exactly the same in patients with hospital-acquired pneumonia and patients with VAP, and, and of course. So, should we need to cover all patients with ab VAP with broad-spectrum antibiotics? This is a very important question, of course, because this is driving a lot of uh, broad-spectrum antibiotic usage in the ICU. My own uh, decision tree is summarized on the slide, and this is also the recommendation made by the new international ERS ASING ECMID ALAT guidelines, very recently published in uh, the European Respiratory Journal. In that decision tree, for the selection of the initial therapy, you need to answer first two questions. What is exactly the severity of the disease? In other words, what is the risk for mortality in that patient? And secondly, what is the risk in that patient that the, the infection be caused by MDR or XDR pathogens? If the risk of mortality is low, and if the risk for MDR pathogen is also very low, in that case, for the initial therapy, it's probably possible to use a monotherapy, for example, using ertapinem, ceftriaxone, cefotaxime, levofloxacin, or moxifloxacin. Because in that case, using that type of antibiotic will be enough. You will cover very well the pathogens responsible for the infection. But if the risk for mortality is high, above 15% using whatever, uh, for example, the Apache 2 score, the SAPS 2 score, the SOFA score. And if based on the risk factors and your local epidemiology, there is a pretty high risk for infection caused by a difficult to treat microorganism, in that case, probably you need to use a broad spectrum coverage. And you will make this decision <coughs> sorry, differently uh, based on the presence or absence of septic shock. If your patient is very severe in case of septic shock, you need probably to use a dual gram pseudomonal coverage and maybe also covering MRSA. But if the patient is stable, no septic shock, in that case, it could be possible to use a monotherapy for covering Pseudomonas aeruginosa. But you will make this decision based on your local epidemiology. And therefore, this is a key message. In your own ICU, you need to know exactly the bugs responsible for ventilator-associated lung infection in your own patients. And based on that, it will be possible for you to customize the selection of the initial therapy based on the clinical picture and also based on your local epidemiology. And as I said, it's probably reasonable to consider as high-risk patients the patient who presents the following risk factors 
for potentially resistant microorganisms. Hospital settings with high rates of MDR pathogens, your local epidemiology, the previous antibiotic use, a recent prolonged hospital stay above five days, or knowing that the patient is colonized with a very difficult to treat microorganism. In that case, you need to cover for Pseudomonas aeruginosa and other difficult to treat gram-negative bacilli. Using PECA PD optimized antimicrobial therapy to improve the outcome of patients infected with MDR pathogens. This is also a very key issue. As you know, in many ICU patients, the pharmacokinetics of all antibiotics is completely modified compared to normal patients admitted to the world. And for example, in patients with sepsis, because of the increase in cardiac output, the modification in the permeability of the membrane permeability, in those patients, in many cases, you will observe first an increased clearance, and secondly, a very high volume of distribution. And therefore, those two factors will contribute to a decreased plasma concentration compared to patients with no organ dysfunction or patients with renal or hepatic dysfunction or patients with uh, organ support. For example, a continuous renal replacement technique or ECMO or both. And very importantly, it's very difficult for one patient in the ICU to know exactly in which category of patient the patient is. A patient, when we are, we, when we are using uh, uh, the normal dosing of antibiotics, will we get decreased plasma concentration or, in contrast, increased plasma concentration? So this is very difficult in the ICU to reach the PKPD target we need to reach for maximizing the bacterial killing. And as you know, for example, for beta-lactams, probably the target we need to obtain is at least 100% <coughs> of the time above the MIC of the antibiotics against the bug responsible for infection. And using this target, 100% above the time, above the MIC, using standardized dosing, we will get, we will reach this target in only roughly 60% of the patient. And as you know, because targeting lung infection, we need not only to reach the PKPD target in the blood, but more importantly, we need to be able to reach the target in the lung. And therefore, we need to take into account the penetration of antibiotics into the lung tissue, which is not so good. And therefore, probably, we need to reach in the blood a higher target, maybe four times above the MIC 100% of the time. And using conventional dosing, you will get that target in only roughly one third of the patients. Of course, it's probably possible to modify the way we are giving antibiotics in the ICU for improving the number of times we will reach the target. And as you know, for example, using a loading dose and then a prolonged duration of infusion, as shown on the slide, in that case, we will maximize the time above the MIC. But if the MIC is pretty high, using even that type of modality of administration, there is a big risk to stay just below the target. So 
just below the MIC and on, under dosing using continuous infusion is a major issue for treating this patient. As I said before, the penetration of antibiotics in the lung is not so good as shown on the slide. And unfortunately, at the moment, we have no good data showing that, for example, using continuous infusion of antibiotics could be the best way for improving the outcome in patients in the ICU. The near future, of course, would be to be capable to adjust antibiotic dosage based on the pathogen MIC and also based on daily determined antibiotic unbound blood concentration. As you know, for the moment, it's probably possible only for a few antibiotics, vancomycin, aminoglycosides, but probably not in many ICUs for beta-lactam. De-escalation, once cultures are available on day two or day three. This is very important because as I said before, initially, we will need in many patients to use a broad spectrum uh, antibiotic regimen in order to cover all the possibilities. But in fact, in many cases, hopefully, the infection is not caused by such microorganisms. And therefore, in many patients, with VAP, VAT, it's possible to stop all antibiotics on day three if the diagnosis appears now very unlikely. This is a strategy proposed by Dr. Klompas from Boston. We need also to stop vancomycin or linezolid if no MRSA is identified. As you know, in many European countries, the epidemiology regarding MRSA is really improving. And therefore, in many cases, we will start vancomycin or linezolid, but on day two, no positive cultures for MRSA. In that case, you should, you should stop vancomycin or linezolid. And also, very importantly, if it's possible to cover the pathogens responsible for the infection, you need to de-escalate. You, you need to stop to discontinue broad spectrum beta lactam and to use those antibiotics only when the pathogen is not susceptible to other agents. And also, very importantly, we have very strong data showing that it's possible to switch to monotherapy after three days. This is the results of meta-analysis showing that there is no benefit at all combining two antibiotics, whatever the bug responsible for the infection. But of course, using a lot of antibiotics, there is a price to pay. And as you know, for example, combining beta-lactam with amikacin or gentamicin, the nephrotoxicity could be really problematic shortening the duration of therapy. Of course, a too long duration of treatment may favor the emergence of resistant or even XDR strains. It will all <coughs> also expose to antibiotic toxicity, increase the cost, and not necessarily improve outcome. And we have good data showing that in many cases, based and randomized controlled trial results that it's possible to shorten the duration to eight days of antibiotics. This is uh, one of the studies we did to assess the potential benefit of uh, shortening the duration of therapy. As you can see, exactly the same survival goal, exactly the même evolution of the disease, for example, regarding the improving in PF ratio from day one to day 28, exactly the same evolution of the disease, whatever the duration of treatment. And of course, <clears throat> shortening the duration of antimicrobial therapy, you will decrease the rate of pulmonary infection recurrence, 
caused by resistance strains. But of course, sometimes it's not so easy to make such a decision, particularly when the bug responsible is difficult to treat. For example, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. In that case, decreasing the duration of therapy could increase the rate of recurrence. This is why it makes a lot of sense to customize the duration of therapy based on the kinetic of a marker of infection. For example, using the procalcitonin marker. It's very easy to use, for example, that type of decision tree for making the decision to continue or to discontinue antibiotics using uh, the sequential measurement of the procalcitonin concentration in the blood of patients. Using that type of decision tree, it's possible to reduce the antibiotic exposure in the ICU as demonstrated in that randomized control trial we did a couple of years ago and recently confirmed in a very large RCT done in Netherlands confirming that using the procalcitonin marker it's possible to reduce the antibiotic exposure in that type of infection uh, and also very importantly to reduce the mortality. Very interesting message less antibiotics, less mortality. So we have really a very large margin of safety for decreasing the antibiotic use in the ICU. And this is a recommendation made by uh, <coughs> in, in the new uh, guidelines published recently, as you can see on the slide. So this is my personal care bundle for managing patients with VAP suspicion obtain BL specimen as soon as patient is suspected before introduction of new antibiotics, start antibiotics very early in the course of the disease, select the initial treatment based on the risk factors for MDR using an explicit algorithm, using your own local epidemiology, stopping antibiotics when cultures results are not confirming the reality of infection, streamlining antibiotics on day two or three, and shortening the duration of treatment. But you know, it's very easy to put that bundle of care on a slide, but you need to monitor and control that not only you say what you want to do, but more importantly, to be sure you are doing exactly what you think you are. So the only way is to monitor and to control what you do in your own ICU. Exactly the same as a pilot and a copilot in a plane, a checklist, and also a copilot for making sure that the checklist is really implemented in the ICU. So thank you so much for attention. And I am ready for questions or comments, of course, if you want. Thank you very much, uh, Jean, for this uh, overview. Of course, it's quite a challenge to um, discuss all these important aspects of um, pneumonia management in the ICU in just uh, um, under an hour. I think you did a great job. job. There um, have been a few questions on several topics, and I'll try to summarize them. Um, according to the different uh, uh, topics. There were quite a number of uh, questions, uh, Jean, regarding the, uh, uh, the BAL, so the um, technique to mm -hmm. diagnose um, the um, pneumonia. There were a number of questions regarding the, um, the volume uh, to be used for lavage. Yeah. Yeah, this is a very important question, of course, because using BAL, you need at least 100 20 ml, just to be sure that you are sampling the deep compartment of the lung, which is the uh, <coughs> alveoli <coughs> sorry, compartment. So this is one of the limitations when you are using, which is called a mini BL, using only 10 ml of saline, for example. In that case, you are only sampling the uh, bronchiole, probably. 
Okay, most of the care, in most of the patients, this is in fact a bronchopneumonia and therefore could be enough to, to, to do that. But once again, using 120 ml, this is the way to go for being sure that you are sampling enough alveoli into the lung, roughly 1 million of alveoli using 120 ml, and also sampling the deep compartment. Some uh, attendees um, were kind of worried using this uh, high volume. Do you see any disadvantages when you use this technique? Any recommendations, maybe patients in whom you would recommend not to use the high volumes in terms of, you know, yeah. um, <coughs> oxygenation uh, yeah. issues? Yeah, but, but first, bronchial lavage is, is very easy to, to perform in the ICU on a patient receiving mechanical ventilation. This is, of course, completely different in patients not uh, receiving mechanical ventilation. But if the patient is mechanically ventilation, it's very safe to, to do a conventional bronchial velar lavage. Of course, in the most severe cases, maybe you, you, you need to be very prudent and to use a smaller amount of saline. But even in IRDS patients, most of the time, uh, the bronchial lavage is very well uh, tolerated. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Um, some questions regarding um, diagnosis and, and especially the role of imaging. I think you very nicely showed us all mm -hmm. the, um, the issues with conventional imaging. Two different questions on the same topic, one on the use of ultrasound and the other one on um, CT yeah. scans, uh, which of course we do more often now maybe compared to 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, oh, this is a very good question. Advice of there? Oh. Well, yeah, please go ahead, uh, Jan. No, 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 that's... Uh, uh, what what is my answer? Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, long sonography makes a lot of sense and it's true, using this technique, it's possible to document the, uh, the presence of some pulmonary abnormalities very easily. Of course, there is a learning curve. It's not so, so, so simple uh, at the bedside. And you need to cover all the lung area. But OK, it's not so difficult after uh, uh, some educational course, of course. But you know, and this is exactly the same for the CT scan. Using these techniques, you will increase the sensitivity for documenting pulmonary infiltrate, but there are, there are no ways at all using this technology to be sure that those abnormalities were not present a couple of days ago. And as you know, in fact, most, if not all pneumonia are occurring in some longer area already involved by a prior uh, uh, d d d disease. Uh, for example, a telectasis, we, uh, as you know, if you do a CT scan in a patient receiving mechanical ventilation, at least three or four days of mechanical ventilation, in more than 90% of those patients, you will document the presence of some infiltrates. And therefore, using the CT scan or um, the lung sonography, you will only document the presence of some infiltrates. But you have no data to confirm that this, territory, this area in the lung is infected. The only way using imaging techniques to prove the reality of pneumonia, and, and this is in fact the criteria uh, from the FDA, is a new pulmonary infiltrate or a progressive pulmonary infiltrate. But you will get those two signs only in a small fraction of the patient, and probably only in the most severe cases. Most of the time, pneumonia involved a previously 
uh, 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 abnormal territory in the lung. Is it clear? This is also yep. a, a very important message. Okay, this thank you very much. Is possible to use the concept of ventilator-associated tracheobronchitis if you are using the, the, the strict microbiological criteria. Okay, um, I, well, questions keep on coming in and I'll have to disappoint some of the, the uh, attendees. We won't be able to cover all questions. A number of questions are on the use of inhaled antibiotics. There's a lot of buzz around uh, that, yeah. of course. Um, uh, any, any role for an, inhaled antibiotics at this moment? Yeah, so regarding inhaled antibiotics, of course, it makes a lot of sense for doing that. But in fact, this is not so easy, in fact. You, you, you need to be very careful using the good device, uh, uh, using the good uh, uh, ventilator setting, and, and so on. So you need to follow a strict bundle of care for using that. And more importantly, for the moment, we have no data in, in the ICU showing that using inhaled antibiotics possible to improve the prognosis of the patient. It was possible to do that only in observational studies. And as you may know, the last uh, randomized controlled trial done by the team of Marin Kolev, published in CHESS, was completely negative. Using a very good device and a combination of two antibiotics, phosphomycin and, and amikacin, and nevertheless, and despite the fact that in many cases the infection was caused by difficult to treat microorganisms, nevertheless, no benefit at all. So for the moment, my deep feeling <coughs> is that inhaled antibiotics should be reserved for patients with uh, uh, some infection caused by XDR pathogen, for which we have no good antibiotics uh, for covering the bugs. For example, uh, patient infected by CRE or, or, or that type of bugs. Uh, in that case, okay, we need to use inhaled antibiotics. We are waiting the results of the ongoing phase three trial. We will get the we will get the results in a couple of months. So maybe I will change my my feeling. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. A short question, a short answer. Is there still um, any role for uh, distinguishing early versus late VAP? It depends on your local epidemiology. I think it makes a lot of sense in many European countries when the local epidemiology is pretty good. But for example, in other European countries or other, in other countries, uh, probably, yes, it makes no sense at all to, to use uh, uh, early versus late onset pneumonia. It depends on your local epidemiology. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Um, I think this brings us uh, to the end of this uh, webinar. I would like, uh, first of all, okay. of course, to thank uh, Jean Chastre for uh, presenting uh, on this uh, very interesting uh, topic. Was, again, it was a challenge to do all of this in uh, under an hour. I'd like to thank uh, the audience for uh, attending and the interaction with the uh, questions. Uh, and finally, I'd like to uh, again uh, point you to the um, pneumonia course we'll be hosting at the ESICM office in Brussels on November 21st and 22nd. More information can be found on the uh, ESICM uh, website. Registration is open. And with this, okay, I'd like so to, thank you. to thank you and uh, wish everybody a good uh, afternoon and a good evening. Thank you very much, Sean. Okay. So, good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.